This is Girl Stop Playing, a weekly show that empowers black women to stop playing with their potential so they can live a life that they love. I'm Coriel, your favorite homegirl, and I'm on a mission to help black women make the money and get the honey. You can have it all as long as you're willing to work. This is Girl Stop Playing, and I am all about encouraging you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want. Today's guest is a working woman who has done literally so much that I'm going to have to ask her to introduce herself, okay? The accolades, the honors, literally the titles that you hold, um, the work that you do. I'm super excited to have been introduced to you, and I am even more excited to have the opportunity to introduce my people to the world of Dr. Jew. So who is Dr. Jew? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Um, you, you were able to get me out of the office for a little while, so I appreciate that. Yes. Um, so, Dr. Jew, I hail from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I am a transplant. I have been here since I was 18. Okay. I came here to go to college. And, you know, when I got close to the graduation, I was like, it's cold up there. I like it down here. Mm -hmm. I hardly even need a coat. So, I just stayed, and um, my undergrad degree was in biology. I knew I wanted to go to medical school, but in my senior year, I just knew I was not ready, um, so I didn't even apply. I took my you know, entrance exam, but I did not apply. I said, I think I need to take a little time off, mm -hmm. so I actually taught high school okay. in the Atlanta public school system, Ooh. and then I went back to medical school. How long did you teach? I only taught. A year and a half. Uh -huh. Oh, and a half. A how, year. How, how did it end up being a half? And a half. Well, because I, when I finally started, it was January. And oh, so gotcha. I so that them, was the half. I was yeah. like, oh, they must have really cut up that second year. You, no, you left no, in the half. I, okay, what? but the half was on the front end. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it so much. Both my parents um, are, are educators? former educators. Okay. I enjoyed it so much, but my mother did. I remember her calling me and saying, um, are you are you going to still apply? Because she would hear my passion about education. Mm -hmm. And I taught at an alternative school. Mm -hmm. So smaller classroom settings, I think that's the answer mm -hmm. <laughs> in the world mm -hmm. today. But smaller classroom settings, just it was an opportunity to really interact with the students. But nonetheless, went to medical school and happened to decide on OBGYN. Um, so I went back north, Pittsburgh. And I said, no, it really is cold. So after my four years of training um, and ever since, I've been here in Metro Atlanta since 2005. And I have been um, operating out of DeKalb County, Rockdale County. And I decided to start my own practice in 2011. So that's what I've been doing. Um, I finally got a partner about a year and a half ago, uh, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, I do not deliver babies anymore because... In all of this time, I've gotten married and I have my own two kids. Mm -hmm. And there's something about children, you know, saying, well, mommy, I know you're not going to be able to be there. So auntie can record for you. And that just broke my heart. And I just could not keep doing that. So I have been um, a gynecologist mm -hmm. only. But I have other hats that I wear and a lot of organizations that you serve, serve yes. leadership. I, I do do a lot. You do you do so much that the video of all that she does, it was so big it could not even be sent to me. Okay, I got a snippet of the video of what oh. of all that you do. <laughs> like I could only get a small percentage, and it was still full of just not even just honors and accolades but like your spirit your passion like your purpose just shined through and the fact that you're my soror all of that just shined through this <laughs> this um this montage of kind of who you are and so that's why i wanted to i, I didn't cut in i want to give you the opportunity to sure. tell the people who you are so we can put some respect on your name because <laughs> the work that you're doing the time that you have literally served the combat pay that you that little bit of pay that you got for serving in the school system um it definitely speaks to your your heart and your passion and and so I'm super excited to have this opportunity to talk to you because you are so passionate about it Thank and you. I think you're welcome and I think sometimes especially talking about the medical field I have my own you know people be calling me a conspiracy theorist and all those other types of <laughs> stuff it's I'm just you know I, I just be wanting to know the truth truth but part of I think the 
negative connotation to the medical space online is very much so it's all money driven and people don't care and it's not heart centered anymore. And so for you to be the opposite of that, to be doing what you love and not doing it because it equals a paycheck, I think that this is what we need to see and who we need to hear from. So I'm super excited to get into the conversation about women's health because we can't be talking about girls stop playing. We can't be talking about making the money and getting the honey if we are not well. If you're not well, that. Thank you for saying that, mm -hmm. and thank you for your platform to share that because that, of course, it 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 it, it tugs at my heart daily, of mm -hmm. course, as a physician. But it also tugs at my heart. I, you know, I like my church, and I go to church, and I'm in different organizations, and I just realize that sometimes the focus we just need to go back to the basics. What are those basics? Well. The basics, you know, I think right now in 2024, it's become, you know, a little cliche, you know, self-care. But, oh, my gosh, we must stop. You hear people talking about the mask, right? You don't want to put the mask on the person on, and on the plane first. You got to put it on yourself. I don't know if people really stop and realize what that means. If you're passing out, what good are you to anybody else? Mm -hmm. And I know we have the kids. I know we have the responsibilities at work. I know that we have, you know, our spouses, our partners, and everything else. We say yes to too many things sometimes. And I could be guilty of that, which is why I kind of pivoted. When I turned 50 a whole year ago, I was like, you know what? No is a complete sentence. Mm -hmm. Without That's a comma behind it. <laughs> exactly. And we have to own that. And not be talked into it all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, well, sister so and so, we know how well you did last year's anniversary dinner. We want you to do it again. Well, that was my last, and I and I'm moving on. And we need to go back to that. The finances we want to do well. We want to invest. You know, we want to take up gardening. We we want to do all these things. But how do we do that if our blood pressure is sky high? How do we do that? If our blood sugars are running high and we're not even recognizing it mm -hmm. or, you know, we are from a family that has certain disease states and we're not addressing it with our providers, with our physicians. Mm -hmm. and, and I heard you um, speak to the potential conspiracy theories that you may have, but I get it. I get it. I just have a conversation with a soror the other day who called me so concerned that you know, she was like, Julianne, do I really need to have that surgery? So I said, girl, give it to me. Let me know what, what you're dealing with. And I shared it with her permission with some of my other colleagues. And we all resoundingly said, girl, no. Mm. And I hate to think that my own colleagues can be doing that. But her issue has resolved. And we are so quick to be told, oh, we'll just cut it off. We'll just, you know, surgically remove. We'll just have this invasive process and procedure. And because we were raised to believe that the doctor knows best, not only do they know best, they have our best interests at heart. We're just going to go with what they said. We don't go get a second opinion. We don't tell the people who love us because we don't want to hear what you have to say. I, I trust and believe in my doctor, which Ideally, that would be the case, right? Ideally, we have this village where the doctor knows you and they have that level of care and concern for you beyond you being a patient, you being, a, you know, feeling like a number when you come into this almost assembly line system that is going to the doctor. Specifically, when we talk about your fields, you know, your field of OBGYN. Me having, my baby is one year old today. Today is my baby's birthday. Okay, literally Aquarius. today. Okay. So, yes, it's Aquarius. <laughs> Turn one today. So I'm very recent to being pregnant, having a child in a hospital setting. So I, you know, am, am, I'm in it myself. And then I also, because I've been in it, I've been having these conversations with other women. And the fear that women have to step foot inside of these hospitals, afraid that they might not come out, mm beyond the fear, the fear being confirmed with how we're being treated when we go into these hospitals, then that fear being compounded with the stories that we're reading and the women who are dying, you know, at the hands of the people who are supposed to care about you the most. It's 
it's already the most frightening experience of your life. You know, so to add on top of that, I might not make it out of this and you probably don't really care about me. And to have heard stories of doctors who say, you know, my baby got a game I got to get to. You're going to hurry up and have this baby or those are real things. Right. So w you being, you know, the anomaly in this system, what's your advice or your wisdom? Because you know that it's happening. What can we do? How, ease that fear a little bit for, for the for First the and foremost, you got to do your research. You have got to do your research. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I I believe that, um, you know, women need to trust not just their their doctors, and we want you to build that relationship. But how do you build that relationship? You know, if you show up on, you know, net, let's say you're just newly pregnant, mm -hmm. and you show up to this new doctor, you've never been to them before, um, you know. Ask your coworker, ask your sister, ask your neighbor, who did they go to? What was their experience like? And I'm, I'm going to give you one little secret, but I can't have everybody doing the same thing. But I'm just saying, call the, call the hospital. Call the hospital where that doctor delivers out of and get an opinion over the phone. I've done that. Call and say, hey. I'll just use my name. You know, I hear Dr. Burt, you know, delivers at your hospital. Do you think that's a good idea? Or my girlfriend is pregnant. She's new. She's moving down there. And I want to give her a suggestion. Who would you suggest? Mm. Do some digging. Do some digging. I'm telling you, it would be mind blowing. And if you do that, you do the research, find out. I'll give another example and I don't know what your situation was, but sometimes you can find a very sweet, caring, small office and you gel with them. But do you know that at five on one, your doctor's not going to be the one to show up? That part. When your water breaks. Know that. That shift is changing, baby. That shift is changing and they are not coming in. Hello. Or it's Saturday. That's not their weekend. That is how things are moving, but... Find what works for you. Mm -hmm. If you are able, consider a doula. I don't know if people understand. I've been working with doulas since I was in residency back in Pittsburgh. Doulas were great then. They're great now. Mm -hmm. They're trained to be there. Old studies show that women do better when they have a support system. So, I mean, I know we love our mamas, but sometimes mama is not the it's support. It's the that stress you, system. Oh, not my God. System. Baby. But, but they putting in your IV, you get an epidural or not getting an epidural. You want somebody who is supporting you, mm -hmm. whatever that may mean. If you want to go to a practice that has midwifery care, certified nurse midwives, there are practices that are built with midwifery care. Now, if you had to, let's say, end up with a cesarean delivery, mm -hmm. they can still be there in the room with you. They're just not the ones doing the mm -hmm. actual surgery. But develop a relationship. Like you said, you don't want to feel like a number. Um, are, the, are you giving uh, given eye contact? Or is someone constantly on their computer, ma'am? What's your age, ma'am? When was your last period? Did they ever take a breath and look up at you? Did they address what your concerns or was their hand on a doorknob at the end of what they thought was the visit? You may have a list of questions mm -hmm. in your purse that you haven't even addressed. Do you feel comfortable asking those questions? What are their policies after hours if something were to, to happen? Who am I calling? Who's going to get back to me? How long is it going to take? Ask questions. Mm -hmm. But that goes to the you don't question authority figures. You don't you know, it's that it's we have been taught. And I mean, if we go back real history lesson, you know, back to slavery days of of how black people were treated within the medical, you know, within the medical system. I think all of that matters. I think all of that goes into our lack of information and our lack because we lack information. We also lack the ability to advocate for ourselves. Right. We don't even realize we have a right. You get into that hospital and they start acting like that's their baby. You know, <laughs> seriously, they start acting like you're going to tell me what I'm going to do. You know, like you're dictating to me what has to be done. And, and at no point do you make it feel like I am in control exactly. and I get to decide. And, you know, I 
and because you know I got a little conspiracy theory and because I watched all the documentaries and did all the research I and I planned to do a home birth a water birth and I had a midwife and I was doing dual care and all of these things the first time and I still got slapped in the face with reality and ended up in the hospital and ended up at the hands and mercy of the staff and I'm telling you y'all you could be tough as nails Okay, you can have it all figured out. But when you get into that room and it comes down to your baby's life, literally, you don't pretty much go with whatever they're scaring you into going with because I'm leaving here with a healthy baby. Right. So if you're convincing me that this what is going this what it's gonna take for me to leave here with a healthy baby, there's not too much fighting I'm gonna do. Now I did, me personally, I tried to fight. I fought for about twenty six hours oh. and then I just gave in. I just gave in. I just gave in. <laughs> and you know, we ended up having a C section. All of the things that all I didn't of, want to all have. All of what you didn't. But want. the second time around, I did definitely feel like I was able to advocate for myself. Um but that was me being empowered from the first time. Mm-hmm. I've heard so many stories of that first time. The, uh, the And I know you probably know the real facts. I'm just making stuff up over here. But the percentage of women who I think end up with a C-section on their first child, just based on my conversations, what, what you think? it's been higher because they didn't know as much. They couldn't advocate. They didn't know. They were scared, you know. And you tell me. Fill in the blanks. Am I am I getting it right or am yeah, I a little wrong? Yeah. I, a little yes. wrong. Okay, go no, ahead. No, no, no. No, you are correct. Um, because knowledge is power, and so you were able to arm yourself a little differently um, second time around, correct? Um, But I'm going to go back to what you said. When you have all those folks coming at you, Mm -hmm. and let me tell you, my sister, I never forget, she shared that with me. Her first experience, she was a a teen mom, and she says, oh, my gosh, when when they come in there and say, you need to have a C-section, as soon as you say yes or the pen is not even dry yet, all the people running in there, the anesthesiologists, the anesthetists, the scrub tech, the this, the that, people are putting things inside you. They're, you know, they're doing all kind of things. She said it's overwhelming. Just that conversation with my own sister helped me to realize how scary, because I've been practicing longer than I've been uh, a, a natural mom myself, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So I listened to that. And that is why, for me, people ask me, do I miss doing deliveries? Do I miss obstetrics at all? And I said, what I miss are the relationships that I've built. I miss if it is their third time around and I did the first two. So those are the times that I really truly miss it. But I also miss it because one thing about me, the nurses used to say at my the main hospital I delivered out of, Dr. Bird, your patients, they always would say how my patients were different. And I said, because I talked to them. That's why she didn't just show up here with, you know, some silly reason why. Oh, I had heartburn and I, I thought I should just come in. No, I've talked to her on the phone. She knew to call me. We built a relationship. Mm-hmm. And what I would say to them, somewhere about a month before their due date, I would have one-on-one conversations in the exam room. And I'd say, listen, I want you to have the experience that you want. You can play trap music if you want to. You can have the experience that you want if you want the the lights lower, dim. If you want it just to be you and your partner, if you want to be alone, you have the experience that you want to. But let me explain something to you. The end goal that you shared is you want you and a baby or babies if you're with multiples. You want to take all of those folks home healthy. Mm-hmm. So you know how I am. If I come to you and I say, it's time, I built that trust. And I had a patient share that with me recently. I haven't seen her in years. She goes, remember when you said, and you came to me and you said, I don't have time to play with you. (laughs) Your baby's heart rate is down. Mm -hmm. And we want to take a healthy baby home. But there was a buildup of trust with that. But that's me as the doctor. So I get it. Now you're trusting that I am delivering at a facility that you can trust all those women who, and mostly women, right, on the labor and delivery floor. Mm -hmm. And that is huge. So sometimes that is me as your physician having a conversation. Look, room, room one over there, let me tell you, maybe she's experienced a horrible setback or a loss or this is her first baby after multiple miscarriages. Sometimes it should, it should be on me to set the pace and set the tone. But what you have shared, I don't know that it's necessarily conspiracy. 
it's our history. And when you mention slavery, it takes me back to our story. Anastasia is one of the women. We know her name. Anastasia was a young girl who had delivered babies. And in those days, in the eighteen mid-1800s, the story takes place. She, like a lot of women, had major, major um, complications after they delivered. Namely, it's a, called a, vag, a vaginal fistula, um, a ureteral vaginal fistula, or the opposite. A fistula is a connection that should not be. So after pushing and after maybe a traumatic birth, this channel may form between the bladder or the urethra and the vagina or the rectum. I'm, yeah. Can I Sorry, s- my imagination. No, no, go, go yeah, ahead. You're trying to imagine uh-huh. it. And so what are slave women good for? Other than taking, they took care of the master's house. They took care of the other women in, in the master's mm-hmm. house delivering babies. But we want you back, not only working in the fields or if you were in the house, fine. But we need you because we want you to do what? Produce more. And so if you remember the story, I'm sure you've heard about Dr. Marion um, Sims, mm-hmm. right? J. Marion Sims is the doctor that they have always given credit I learned his name. We have Sims retractors that come from him. His bust and his likeness was all over the place, and they fought to get him pulled down from multiple places. New York, I believe, is one of them, too. Because the masters used to just offer the slave women. Anastasia is, like I said, one of the ones that we remember her name. And he was experimenting with surgeries to fix those fistulas. And the master said, hey, yeah, we want them back. We need them back, so let's fix them. That woman had over 30 operations on Mm. her. This is before the time of anesthesia. Mm. And there's a picture, a very um, iconic picture that someone drew of her. You know, her face is just, she's just on a table. Do you think if somebody had a knife to your private area, you just sitting there laying there? Posing for your photo. Right. And there's pictures of white men around her, and they you know, basically talk about how it took all of those times for them to finally get the surgery right, even when they figured it out. Same thing with the Tuskegee. We call it the Tuskegee experiment, right? Now, penicillin, we didn't know. They did not know the penicillin cured syphilis early on. But by the time we got to 1972, they knew that penicillin was the cure. They withheld it Mm -hmm. because they wanted to see, right, what was the life cycle Mm -hmm how they had to understand and learn about primary syphilis, secondary syphilis, tertiary syphilis, latent syphilis, and they used our menfolk in Alabama to learn those lessons. So that's, it's not about conspiracy, it's the history. Or the women, seems a lot comes out of Alabama, but there was a a man, I have a patient who knew this story. I said, ma'am, why does does your record show that you had a tubal ligation when you were 21? Well, because there was this doctor. They were sterilizing all of the young black girls because she already had two kids. She didn't need any more. So that's why with Medicaid, if if our folks have Medicaid, nowadays you have to sign a consent and it has to be valid for a certain period of time because they know our history. So I can't blame Mm -hmm. even my family members. Girl, I ain't taking that medicine. It says it can cause, you know, I get it. So or what's COVID. The solution? <laughs> Ooh, we ain't even look. We gonna talk about go COVID and the vaccination. You go there? I understood why. I understood ex- very clearly why people were not at the front of the line for those vaccinations. Mm-hmm. But anywho, yes, ma'am. What's the solution though? Because you could be, you could again, you could have your mind made up. You could do all of the things, and then you still end up at the hands of these people who you do not trust. So, is the only solution? Be able to advocate for yourself. Advocate for yourself and find, I'm saying this, this is not just coming from my opinion. Studies have shown that African Americans or minorities, I'll just say, do better when they have a system that looks like them, including the physician. That doesn't mean it's perfect. But you probably are going to have a better chance of getting even I'm no I'm a women's health specialist but how am I going to get my husband to take 
his antihypertensive medication to get those blood pressures under control. If I have another black male doctor looking at him saying, you know, my daddy died when he was 52. You're 52, right? <laughs> Having that relatability. Oh, my goodness. Matters. It is huge. And that is what we need. That's why I just had this conversation with a young girl today, uh, one of my patients. I'm always in their business. So what you doing? You're 22. You're in school. Da, da, da. What you want to be when you grow up? And I'm like, oh, you want to be a doctor? Okay, how am I going to help you do that? Because I don't know if you know, but statistically, we're at the bottom. African-American female physicians, we make up 2% of mm. all working, practicing physicians in this country. 2%. But yet we're, what are we, 13%, I think, now, the whole gamut. So we should at least be 6.5. Something. <laughs> that, 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 I mean, that to me is a direct correlation with the statistic of, you know, a black woman is X number of times more likely to die. And sh- in that, childbirth? Yeah, that absolutely. is a direct correlation. A- absolutely. Um, I actually was um, had the opportunity to um, meet the gentleman who we, we hear all of this from because, unfortunately, you, I know we know, um, what's her name, Judge Glenda Hatchett. Mm-hmm. Her daughter-in-law mm-hmm. died because of implicit bias, right? She did. She wasn't obese. She was very healthy, intelligent as all get out, spoke six different languages. She uh, rode... Uh, uh, speed cars. I mean, this woman was fabulous and had a husband and a son. And because they did not listen to him saying, I, I, it looks like there's blood in the bag, which means the Foley catheter bag. She's not our priority right now. Mm-hmm. That woman died. Mm-hmm. She should be here. She should be here, but she is not. So implicit bias is real. I've seen it. I, I'm ashamed to say I've seen it. When we talk about, um, and some of those documentaries you may have uh, uh, been able to witness, the conversation around pain, Mm -hmm. right? Black Mm -hmm. women, we don't have the pain receptors. I literally had the nurses tell me, oh, well, the, the, um, what's it called? The, no, the pro, when they are... um, when they're putting you into labor, Pitocin. Oh, the Pitocin. Well, the Pitocin, yeah. you can't be in that much pain. It's only at a level. Right. That does not correlate. Hello. How that are you correlate. going to tell me that I cannot be in pain? I went off on a nurse, and this isn't even labor. Well, yeah, she was pregnant. I had a pregnant patient years ago who had sickle cell. Anemia, not sickle cell mm-hmm. trait. Sickle cell anemia, if you know anything about sickle cell and pregnancy and high stress situations and all of that, your um, red blood cells will start to sickle. Well, sickling means that it gets can start getting to get trapped in the small blood vessels. It causes pain. So when you hear people talk about a sickle cell crisis, they're in excruciating pain. And I had a non-melanated nurse. I'm feeling some feelings right now. <laughs> Walk out the room with me as I after I saw my patient, and she goes, you know, I'm starting to think she only came in here because she wanted those meds, her morphine. Whew. I knew I still wanted to be a doctor, so I didn't rear her back. And I just, I, I laid into her. Do you have any family members? Do you know anyone? Did you ever go to school with someone who had that diagnosis. Did you Mm -hmm. understand what it means? So I had to, you know, educate, had to put my teacher hat back on, and I had to educate her about that. But the gall to try to say that this young person who is literally having the life just choked out of her, right, sickle cell crisis, these women, especially my pregnant patients, they're in pain. Mm -hmm. They're in pain. Um, They can't breathe. They can't move. They don't want to eat. They just need to calm the pain down. And we, at times, and this was the case of this patient, gave her a morphine pump so she can control Mm -hmm. how much pain relief she would get at any certain time. I've had anesthesiologists 
say, well, I'll get to her. She's in pain. She wants her epidural, but you're not prioritizing. Or she's in the midst of a contraction. You want her to hold her body still so you can get the needle in. We get that. No, you don't want to paralyze the patient, of course. But I have watched them roll their eyes. Can you have some empathy? I have watched it myself. I go, ma'am, if you want this epidural, you're going to have to stay still. Ooh, child. So it's 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 <laughs> a it's a lot. Um, it's it's everything all at once. Again, birth is literally the closest thing to death, it right? Is. And it's like all of the scariest things that you could possibly be thinking about, be experiencing, be hearing. Go, you know the the conversations that you're not a part of, but that you're privy to, that nobody's explaining to you. It's so much, and I hope I'm not scaring y'all. Scaring this whole conversation has been pretty scary. Uh, Advocate for yourself, though. If you're not yes. in Atlanta, uh, the blackity black, beautiful city where I'm sure you can find a black doctor. Um, is there like a resource, like a black doctor? I know they have one for black therapists. Is there one for black, like there. black OBs? Oh, OBs, OBs specifically. specifically. Well, I will tell you, I have uh, a colleague. I will share his information. Um, I hope I'm saying it right. Uh, Dr. Frank Jones, he, like myself, is a past president of the Atlanta Medical Association. He just started a directory. Okay, okay. And I want to say it's called My Black Doctor. We'll, you'll give it to me and we'll link it down below. Please. Yes, we he will link it down that below. Because that is what he's been working on for over a year now, and he just launched it. In the fall. I love that because I think we're definitely spoiled. I think people watch this in the middle of Wisconsin and they be like, girl, all of that sound real good, but I'm not going to drive a thousand miles to my nearest black doctor. And that, that, I forget that. That I know of. I forget that. Mm-hmm. It's easy. Because we're I, spoiled. we, we see each other. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we see each other all the time. There's nothing for me to be in a doctor's lounge. And if I start off being the only black in there, that's not how the long. 30 minutes is going to end. Mm-hmm. Because there's just so many of us. There are literally thousands in Metro Atlanta, but not everywhere, like mm-hmm. you're saying. Mm-hmm. And so we forget that ourselves. Um, but there are advocates. There are allies. We there like are to call allies. Them. They are out there. And how you start that conversation is how you start that relationship with as a patient to physician. And you say, how many um, patients in the last year have you had that look like me? Or how many patients have you treated? You know, uh, let's say my last pregnancy I ended up with preeclampsia mm-hmm. I ended up with the need for magnesium how do you treat those patients what do you do blah 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 you have to advocate and you er- uh, earlier said which we do not do enough of second opinions if I'm telling you you have fibroids huge in the African American population right up to 90 percent 80 to 90 percent of black women have fibroids mm. but that doesn't mean all 80 to 90 percent of women need to have a hysterectomy. If your doctor, I want to give you some takeaways because, again, like you said, you want to don't want to scare your audience away. But if your doctor only leans in with one option, ask yourself why. Ask yourself which one of those, what option does he provide? Which one is he going to bill you for? <laughs> I mean, is that not obvious? It is. Logically, it is. But in the midst of a health crisis. Yeah. You're not, not using it. your logic. You're scared. You're like, and, and they're very convincing. I experienced this with my mom where she had a brain tumor and I was the caregiver, I guess, that was, again, me being the conspiracy theorist. I, you're going to explain this to me. We're going to talk about it. I've already done my Googles. So I'm coming in here. I'm not coming in here with a zero. I'm at least at a level one. I have done some preliminary. I've asked some questions online, okay? And it was, there was no other option. It's you do this surgery or you go find somebody else to give you another option. But this is the only thing we offer. Well, why is this the only thing that you suggest? Because this is the only thing you offer. This is literally all that you do. And so you don't want this check going out the door. You want to, you want to cash this check right here. And that was the conversation that, you know, I would ask him things like, well, could her diet be affecting? And, you know, nutrition diet is never mentioned and it's almost shunned when you mention it. It's like, no, what you eat. But do you know why? Because most doctors don't study nutrition. They don't. They don't teach nutrition. They don't know. Yeah. Right. We're not nutritionists. That is crazy. We're not nutritionists. And so you should link with a nutritionist, dietitian, if you need, in the community mm-hmm. and give that. But to your point, and I, I just know me. I, 
you know, I, I think we look different. She a little different. I'm a little different <laughs> because this is this is a conversation that I have often. So, ma'am, you have fibroids. Your fibroid is in a location, and think about Mickey Mouse. <laughs> I laugh because people go, "Oh my God, you just ruined Mickey for me." But think about Mickey Mouse, and let's say Mickey's face is the uterus, but your fibroids are his ears. So they're on the outside. They're on the outside of Mickey's head. If you have fibroids, this is just an example. There's other things that can happen mm-hmm. for other uh, locations too. But it's just the simplest one for me to describe. When I have that patient, oftentimes I would say, if you would like a laparoscopic approach or a robotic-assisted approach, I have colleagues in the community that I can refer you to because I'm so busy doing so many other things. Dr. Jew is not the one who's going to offer that option, mm-hmm. but, but but it is an option. But it, it does is an exist. Option. But let me give you another one, and this is because I feel like I'm just badgering my colleagues, and I don't want to do that. Here's another issue that I don't think the masses understand: your insurance dictates what you can get. But as a gynecologist, I don't feel good only giving you the option because your insurance covers A, B, and C. When there's D, E, and F that you could get if you either, if you could wait till next year and and re-enroll into another insurance plan, maybe, or maybe you would want to pay for but a different. But at least let me of, know. But let, let, let you me be, be the, the decide. decide. Yeah, Absolutely. let me decide because you're, again, I can't advocate for myself. I feel like I don't, you're dictating to me. I have no decision in this. It's do this or go on about your way and figure it out. And, and most people wrong. are not just going to go on about their way and have to call 10 more doctors to see what they are approved for. And if you're a provider and if you're in the network, nobody's signing up to go do that. So again, then, we know. Can I give you one yes, more? Yes, please do. I'm going to give you one more. And this, ooh, I mean, ooh, I, I don't want to hurt folks. But I've been practicing. This year makes 19 years that I've been out of, not medical school, res, but out of residency practicing. 19 years. If I say, well, in my training, in my training, this is what we offer. I trained 20 years ago. You're telling me there's nothing else? Nothing ain't happened since. Nothing ain't, nothing else. No new medication, no new therapy, no new option for the last 20 years. So be careful. You know, even my own mom, I'm going to talk about my mama, you know, she used to not want to see a female doctor, but then her baby became a doctor. She goes, oh, I guess I should trust the, the, the women. Okay. Or they only wanted to trust a little gray hair, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Make certain that the gray hairs know what the latest, greatest. They keep up. They keep abreast of the new technologies, the new medications. And you're going to find that, if especially at a teaching hospital. So that's a little plug for the teaching hospitals, right? But also at the younger physicians Mm -hmm. or surgeons, maybe they only know one way to do a certain operation. They may not know what if the equipment goes down. I need to know another way to get a uterus out. I can't only have operated using the robot. Mm -hmm. I need to know another way to do the same thing, to to get to the same end. So I'm just throwing some things out Mm -hmm. there so that your listeners can arm have some themselves. more considerations. Yeah, and know Absolutely. what we what the options are. Because again, to your point, sometimes it's I can only see this doctor in this group because of my and you know, and, and that will stop us. That will stop us in our tracks. All of the what is it like the red tape? I gotta go through all of this to just even get a consultation to even get you yep. to answer the phone. And then I get to the office. Nine times out of ten, I'm just do whatever you tell me to do. Because <laughs> it took six months to even get here. Yeah. So, so many of those situations, I think there could be another solution. But we don't even realize that it's yep. possible. So we just give in. At so the second price. opinions. We're so going to say it Second opinion. Time. Second opinion. Yeah, and that is opinion. not a diss to your doctor. It is not a curse word. Like, forget dissing anybody. You're doing yourself a disservice. Absolutely. If you're not willing to advocate and for yourself. I have sent patients back to the original doctor. I have been able to reassure patients, ma'am, the option she's given you actually is a good option. Let's talk about these. Well, she did kind of mention that. Mm-hmm. And then maybe if the chart comes back up on my desk, I go, oh, I haven't seen so-and-so. Find out she went 
I reassured. It doesn't mean that you're just like good riddance and mm-hmm. going to mm-hmm. leave the doctor. If you need reassurance, go get it. Please go get Absolutely. it, especially when it comes to your health. So I, you mentioned fibroids. The number of times I've had conversation about fibroids is just crazy. But again, I'm not trying to scare y'all to death. Um, I want to talk about other issues that you're seeing because you're so active in your community, because you're a part of so many women's groups. You're with women so often. And because of what you do professionally, what's the disconnect between what you know people should be doing based on the ailments or the illnesses or whatever you're seeing professionally and like the lifestyle that you're seeing personally and how can we bridge the gap? Um, wow. So what I'm going to say is what I'm going to answer is not just fibroids alone. We've got to start eating better. We have, and because you have young children, I have young children, you've got to teach the next generation how to eat better. Mm-hmm. We have got to stop running to fast food restaurants all the time. Fast food in my household was a treat, and it came probably McDonald's. I got McDonald's once every maybe third month. Man, we knew if we were taking a a family trip, we were getting on the road, we were going to have McDonald's. McDonald's. Something to look forward to, not something something you're going to get every day. Not every Tuesday night. Like, wow. We have to teach ourselves, train ourselves, Stop eating so much processed foods. In this country, if you look at a, a, a graph, you will see the parallel between when sugar was introduced to this country and the diagnosis of diabetes. It, it follows a trend. It follows a trend. And we have to retrain our taste buds. Retrain our taste buds. Everything does not need to be so sweet. For me personally, the little the donut shop with the little light doesn't do a thing for me. It makes my teeth chatter because I don't like sweet things like that. Mm-hmm. A strawberry is sweet enough for me. Let me tell you what did it for me, though, Doc. Let me just tell you personally because I am a sweets girl. Personally, okay. I am a sweets girl. But I ended up having gestational diabetes. Uh-huh. So I went on the rabbit hole of what the hell? I'm, I'm healthy. Why would I? I never had anything, yada, yada, yada. But I know I love sweets. But it really messed me up to realize that the carbs that I love just as much, if not more than those sweets, were having the same result because all that was doing was turning into sugar and it was literally having the same effect. So I think we're even a little ignorant to... Because yeah. people think if they're not eating Krispy Kreme and cakes and pies and things that they're good. They're but good. no, yeah. you, if you're eating bread pasta, all day and sugar pasta. and yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. pasta and rice and all of the things, you're literally still doing the same thing. Yep. So y'all didn't study nutrition and neither did we. Nobody <laughs> studied nutrition. <laughs> and it's the link to everything. What we're eating is literally life or death. So I'll, I'll say this because this has been my change personally. And sometimes I get off, and it's okay. 80-20. 80-20. Exactly. We ain't Love perfect. It. And that's eating plant-based. Mm. I decided a little over a year ago, I was gearing up uh, towards my 50th birthday, uh, which is, was in January 2023. And I said, you know what? I'm going to see if I can do this. And I gave up meat, and I did the whole plant. I, I, I call my lifestyle change change plant mostly okay okay so i ate plant mostly okay (laughs) so it was okay for me but then when my birthday came i just decided to keep it going and so the things that i noticed about me i'm like i'm not bloated anymore i'm not having to you know sit on the toilet every night i mean i just feel better i look better um even my patients would say, oh, my God, you lost weight. I lost 1.5 pounds. But they see it because mm-hmm. I'm not sitting here bloated like I used to be. We don't realize how much food affects us. Uh-huh. And even not just how we look, but like our mood, your cycle. And I know you, I mean, I know you probably Absolutely. know all of the research on how what, what you ingest affects literally how your body functions, mm-hmm. how you feel in your body. When mm-hmm. I stopped eating meat, not only did I lose weight, but it's like the mental clarity that you have. Just your mood changes mood. because you don't have all that trash. Skin. Mm-hmm. Your immune system is healthier. Mm-hmm. These things are true. These things are true. And now, you know, there's litigation about the products in our hair that I used to use. 
10 years ago, I went natural. But the you know, hair, the, the, the creamy the, crap, the beauty, the, the <laughs> lengths that we go to for beauty are literally killing us. That's going to be that's like a whole nother conversation because we have been calling it creamy crack for years. But the nail salons, now we're starting to find out that literally nail, how toxic these yep. products are that are literally living on our bodies. Mm -hmm. You know, you put that, that creamy crack on, you rinse it off. But you have these nails on and most people don't go like take a break in between getting a set of nails. Right, right. It's like a constant year round thing. And who is it sitting in these nail shops? I ain't never seen an Asian lady getting her nails done at the nail shop. Not one time. <laughs> right that right into the show and let me know have you seen one? Just let me know. I personally have not. Have you? Have right, you died? No. Not ever. No. You and might see a white woman every once in a while, COVID. but mm -hmm. I'd never wear their mask. They listen before COVID. Listen, they they knew a little something. They knew, they a little knew something. something. They knew something. But these are the things that we and again, 80-20. I'm not perfect. I got my press on zone, though. Small change. Right? That's a small change. <laughs> I can't, you know, be out here butt naked with my nails, but I'm at least gonna make an adjustment. Gotcha. So I think that's the best that we can do. What's a small adjustment that you can make that's at least gonna help you? go in the right direction of where you want to go. Right. Because ignorance is not bliss. Mm -hmm. Not when it comes to your health. Mm -hmm. So start thinking about when you go grocery shopping. If you haven't heard it before, you're hearing it now. Shop the perimeter. Create your meals from the perimeter of the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Because that's mostly what the produce that's exactly. the fruit, the vegetables. Because everything in the in the middle aisles is processed and has is chock full of salt. To preserve. That's why that can, when you pick it up, it's not going to go bad. It doesn't perish until 2026. Mm -hmm. How I do that? How? <laughs> How? What is it doing inside of you if it's able to do that on this shelf? Yeah. Questions that need answers. They need answers. So, again, 80-20. Maybe you're hurrying. Maybe you don't have time. So, But, but fresh is best. Mm -hmm. Frozen is second. And if you have to go to can... When you crack open, you know, open up the green beans, strain it, rinse it off, put fresh water in the pot. Things that people don't think about. They're literally eating the preservatives that are in the can. Mm. Rinse it off. You know what messed me up, though, Doc? But, and again, because I'd be like, okay, I'm going to rinse this stuff off. But the water got... What is it? Aluminum or metals? Or, the water is, you know, filter. It's, get your filter. I water. need to get a filter. Look, you got it's it's hard out here. It's hard. Eighty twenty. That's gonna be the name of this 80, episode. 20. Eighty twenty. And, and and if somebody, especially the holidays, holidays are bad. I read something years ago that said between November and January first, uh, Thanksgiving and January first, the average American gains seven pounds. Mm. Right. So you got to learn to do the push push back. Right. You can't eat if if somebody is bringing. The Krispy Kreme or, you know, oh, this is my mama's favorite rum cake recipe and you got to got to eat it. That's what I would tell people. I said, now, if it is someone's recipe, I may indulge for the moment. But for me, I'm going to do that once a week. So I have a cheat day. I have a cheat day that I'm just not going to worry about it. And if I happen to decide to go here and go get me something bad i don't know waffle syrup that's not how i eat but i'm just saying then i'm gonna switch it up mm -hmm. and maybe now it's not on saturday but if you know you have a uh an event to go to and it's saturday night or you a ticketed event you know you want to eat and drink what they provide so save your calories save the bad mm -hmm. for that event mm -hmm. the 80 20 it works park at the back of the parking lot the number of people I see driving around trying to see if that lady is going to that first park <laughs> so I can park there. No. And even in the grocery store, if you happen to find me in the middle aisle, that's because that's when I walk. I literally on. walk the ends if I have time because I've been doing way more Instacart these days. But if I go into a store, I walk. To, I don't have a dog or a cat, but I walk through the aisle to get my steps in. Those small shifts. I think that's what it comes down to because I think a lot of times Instagram, social media, the media will have you thinking that you have to go out and be a whole new woman. And that might be ideal, 
But what can you do to just take a step in the right direction? That's what I want to encourage y'all to do. Hopefully this conversation, ha- like hopefully y'all are still here because I know we talked about a whole lot of scary stuff at the beginning. But <laughs> if you are still here, I definitely want to just encourage you to think of a small change that you can start implementing, like a small thing that you can start incorporating on a daily basis, whether it's I'm going to park at the back of the building, not the back of the building, but at the back of the parking lot to go into work. I'm going to take the stairs instead of the elevator. I'm going to pack my lunch. I'm going to bring my lunch instead of going to eat every single day. One quick hack. And y'all, I'm trying to become an Amazon affiliate. I made 50 cents in the last two years. So if you are interested in what I'm about to say, click the link and make a purchase, okay? The Instant Pot is a game changer. Have you heard of the Instant Pot? Uh Uh-huh. Your girl been out here chefing it up, okay? I've been out here making crab legs, beef and broccoli. I had Mongolian beef last night. You can make burgers. I had shrimp scampi. Listen, in the Instant Pot, I haven't made anything that took more than 17 minutes in this Instant Pot. All of those things, okay? So I'm going to link it below. Less than $100. But if you are a single lady and you out here trying to impress a man, get an Instant (laughs) Pot. If you are a mama and you out here trying to manage meals for multiple people, get an Instant Pot. If you are a... You just got to eat. You got to feed yourself. Get an Instant Pot. It will change your life. And it will have people out here real impressed by these meals. Dr. Drew, I've enjoyed you. I don't I think, think so. I'm having no more babies. But you don't even do babies no more. You're gonna. No, You're yeah, gonna. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Just take care okay. of women. I was gonna say, I'm not coming for that. But we'll definitely stay connected, keep in touch. For the people who are watching this and like, I need Dr. Ju. I need to at least keep up with her. Look in this camera right here and tell the people where they can find you on social media and online. Sure. Well, my practice, my practice is located on the east side of town in Conyers. But you can find me at Radiant Women's Health. Radiant women's health that's on social media you can put that in um and find me um we would love to have you i do have a partner now we do the gamut menopause female sexual health and dysfunction i deal with fibroids i do still operate and i still help women who do want to have children who may be having difficulties becoming pregnant it's just that once you do become pregnant I'm shipping you out to somebody else. So we offer all of women's health services. You're going to come back and we're going to talk about menopause. Cause, I mean, I ain't there yet, but, but it's, the, the the things that I have heard, we need to talk about it. Let me tell you, I just diagnosed someone a few weeks ago. She's 38. Ooh. She's 38. So, and that's considered ovarian failure, but it's essentially an early type of menopause. It's real early. It happens... You know, what's, the conversation what's normal? Wait a minute. What is what? normal? What's normal? Yes. So the average age in America, in North America, is 51 to 52. That's that the, the average for black age. Women? But we consider, well, black, we, black women different for everything. But that's just the overall average. Okay. Women go through the symptoms leading up to menopause. The average is like seven to nine years. But if you're Asian, it could be like four years. Black women, 10 years. Why? Like exactly. 40, like forty one? Like you right. said fifty one, forty one. Right. So okay. you got you have to pay attention to the conversation we didn't even mention today about fertility, meaning a lot of women, especially professional women, are delaying purposefully. Please go save your eggs. Freeze your eggs. Mm. Do you know it only became possible in our country uh twenty thirteen? I had to go look that back up because I knew I started my practice in 2011, and it was since I've been in my my private practice that it became a thing. It wasn't. It was done before, but it was more um, for women who've had radiation, chemotherapy, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or surgically removed. But it became an option for the masses. No, it's not free, and most insurances aren't going to cover it. However, it's an insurance policy. Yes. And you, need to, and you need to know your options. And those are not conversations we have in our we community. We don't No. Nope. So I tease that. I tell my patients, I say, I know you're 28, and I know I'm not your, your auntie and them, but I'm getting your business. So who you dating? Is it serious? <laughs> That's what's me. Look, the aunties. Yeah. That is what But I'm is, your doctor auntie. Doctor auntie is what is missing in the community. Yep. The the doctor auntie that has like some credentials behind the conversations that she's having. Like, let me tell you the real, not just yep. based on what I've been through, but based on what I know as well. Yep. Can you come back? I sure will. Okay, she'll be back, y'all. Let me know in the comments. What do y'all want to know? I got a laundry list of things that I'm going to be asking about. Cause your girl has turned to 39 this year. You just scared me with the what? 41 thing. That's but two you years from now. Your babies. 
I don't want to have hot flashes and things. Well, not that that's true. That part. See, we're going to talk about it, though, y'all. <laughs> so I thought I had a little bit more time, but apparently the clock is ticking. If you have enjoyed this episode, please make sure that you subscribe to the channel. If you happen to be listening on Apple or Spotify, leave your girl a five-star review. Make sure you also share this conversation with a friend. It could literally be the difference between life and death. Dang, I should say something else because that's a really scary way to end the episode. <laughs> Um, it will not be the difference between life or death because you have access to this resource. Dr. Ju got you, and she's going to be back. So stick around. I'll see you next week. Peace. So if you made it this far, I just know you loved that episode. Well, what you did not know is that we recorded it right here in ATL at Elevate Studios. Yes, your girl has her own studio, y'all. And it's not just for me. I'm opening it up for you, too. So if you have a podcast, if you are a vlogger, a YouTuber, or a content creator, and you are looking for a professional studio to record your content, or you want to hire me and my team to fully produce your content, make sure you check out the show notes below or log on to elevateagency.com.